Alrighty. Okay, so guys, I'm recording now. We've just gone through the uh, categories of part three original works. Okay, the part four subject matter other than works. Can you recall what they are? Fairly big ticket items here and mostly from the US. Um, I was going to say unfortunately, but I, I guess it's fortunately because otherwise we wouldn't be watching much on TV, would we? Are these the, the technical works, like the, how the, the creation of a television program, etc.? Yep, so TV, broadcast, sound, broadcast, and... Uh, films or... Uh -huh. That's what I was looking for. Films and sound. Yeah. Sound recordings. TV broadcasts, sound broadcasts. And what's the funny little ragtag hanger on or that's on the end there? Can you recall? Published editions. Nice one, Vanessa. Awesome. So then, thinking back to our IP Ready Reckoner, the duration of copyright for those original works, so those part three works that we've just spoken about up the top there, literary, artistic, musical, dramatic, what's the duration here? And here it's one duration for all of those kinds of works. Can anyone remember? It's very long. Seventy. Beautiful. 70 years. Now, can anyone... Uh, add on to that from the end of the death of the author yes the calendar year in which the author died yes very long period of protection what do you all think about that period of protection do you think it's inordinate or do you think that it's about right why do you think we protect for 70 years uh, it's probably because of the commercial value with that that can be passed on to the heirs of the author that's yeah that's historically the justification for such a, a lengthy period of protection you're absolutely right Hoselita. um it, it was considered that um, an author needed to provide for their living issue, their children. And um, that's, that has been the justification for successive uh, extensions of the copyright term. I mean, when, when I first started looking at IP law, um, protection was only 50 years. Can anyone tell me why it was lengthened out to 70? You get like three gold stars and 50 brownie points for this one. Can anyone hazard a guess why it blew out from 50 years to 70 years? I'll take a couple of different answers. I'll take a cynical answer <laughs> and an academic answer. Um, this is a terrible guess, but I only remember because I watched a video a couple of years ago on YouTube about, in the, uh, probably different, but in the US they extended the, um, the copyright protection because I think Mickey Mouse was going to come out of copyright <laughs> protection and they just extended it. They have. Historically, I know, right, because Mickey is an all-important cultural icon. <laughs> um, yeah, look, the US pressured us uh, during the um, free trade negotiations and uh, Europe already had 70 years and that was the academic answer I was looking for and so the culmination of all of that pressure just basically led us to you know blow it out and uh, you know comply and just do what everybody else was doing. Um, does anyone feel that that Length of protection is really disadvantageous for Australia. Does anyone have any views on that, or do you think it's all good? And if you've if you've created a, an excellent fictional work like oh I don't know the Twilight book series, um, that that author should be able to provide for their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. 
Does anyone have a view? Think about what it does to Australia's economic position and think about whether Australia is a net importer or net exporter of copyright works. Does that give you anything to chew on? No? Well, perhaps the more cynical, cynical of us might uh, say, well, yeah, that, that 70 years is going to work very well if you're someone like the US because it's going to bring you a fairly hefty economic return for your country's net export of copyright works, isn't it? In terms of Australian economy, query what that length of protection does to our obligations to have to keep paying the premium prices that we have to keep paying for copyright protected works. Yes, I'll just leave you to mull that one over. All right, so duration of copyright for part four subject matter than other than works. So I'll go here first, films, sound recordings, TV and sound broadcasts and published editions. All right, who's got an idea about films? Uh, 70 years, I believe. Nice work. Kim, isn't it? I haven't got your name popping up, Kim. Um, 70 years, exactly. From the end of the year in which the film was first published. All right, what about sound recordings? Anyone? Uh, it's the same, 70 years as well. Yes, you are absolutely right. Oh, hang on, have we just had somebody else join us? Hello, if someone else has joined us. Okay, 70 years, you're absolutely right. From the end of the year, etc. What about TV and sound broadcasts? Not quite so generous here. Anyone got an idea on those? Anyone? 50. Yes? Published editions. So we're going down on a sliding scale here. There's a hint. Anyone? Oh, nice. Who just jumped in there? Was that Vanessa? It was, yes. Nice job. Did you say 25? 25, yes. Good job. Nice work. Okay, 25 years. Alrighty. Why do you think there is a discrepancy between film and sound recordings and TV broadcasts and sound broadcasts. Anyone has it a guess? What's the nature of a film? Do you normally watch it and re-watch it and re-watch it? Ooh, like, you know, Twilight. <laughs> Sorry, that's the most, I was going to say trashy, dear idea. That's, that's the most interesting example I could think of. What about sound recordings? I mean, if you happen to own a CD, old technology, I know, or if you happen to have a Spotify account uh, and you want to listen to a sound recording, might you want to listen to that sound recording in 30 years, 50 years? What about a TV or a sound broadcast? Is it a little less likely to be re-watched, re-viewed, rehashed. Yes? Hmm. So, hence we have a discrepancy there. All right, any queries on the nature of works and subject matter and the duration? No? All right. Why do we only protect original works? 
What do you think that that idea ties in with? There's a couple of things that the text talks about. Hmm. Okay, let's backtrack a little bit. What is the idea of originality? What are the things that a court will consider when they're trying to work out whether or not something is sufficiently original? Perhaps the effort and labor, the intellect that a person put into. Hazlito wins. Yes. So you've got to have sufficient skill, labor, and judgment, don't you? Because if copyright protected anything, for example, the word apple, say I, I ran to the court and said, I own copyright in the word apple. In fact, I'll, I'll come up with something that's an actual, <laughs> an actual example from practice. I had a potential client come in and say, I want to claim copyright in the alphabet because I don't like what this polit political party in my hometown is trying to publish in the newspapers. So I want to claim copyright in the alphabet so that I can stop them from publishing words I don't like. <laughs> You get all sorts in practice. Okay, what is the idea of only protecting original works all about? What is that whole concept designed to do? I mean, could my client claim copyright in the alphabet? <laughs> no, no, it's a literary work. But they certainly didn't, they weren't the author of that literary work. So there's your first thing that originality ties into is the notion of authorship, okay? In order to claim copyright protection, you have to be the author of that particular literary, musical, dramatic or artistic work, okay? The other thing and I'll go back to my apple example, if I claimed copyright in the word apple, what would that do to other people's use of the English language? How would you describe the uh, particular red or green fruit that was usually, that was usually uh, sweet and tasty and ordinarily around about three ninety nine a kilo. How would you describe that if you couldn't use the word apple? What word would you use? You see what I mean? You need to have a certain common stock of words in the English language. So, the concept of only protecting original works means that it has that sufficient spark of creativity that the author has applied to the English language in the case of literary works in order to come up with the particular combination of words that they have come up with. Okay? Amanda? Yes? Is that like that idea expression dichotomy thing with the free speech, the balancing of the free speech and stuff? Absolutely. But is, is that, so originality, if you're talking about the element that they said, you know, fixed in a material form, is yes. that what it means as well? Like it's written down or? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. What, what about the stuff that's, that's not written down that's, uh, I suppose there's an area of that too, like with Indigenous sort of, works and customary stuff that's not it's only communicated verbally yes and so you couldn't get that protected by copyright it could be something else yeah exactly and in fact there are current um uh, discussions happening in the united nations in relation to protection of uh traditional knowledge and it, it's it's 
it's a very interesting area because it, it kind of falls outside most of copyright uh, parlance and you wouldn't trademark it. It's not patentable. So where does it fit? Um, it's very deserving of protection, but it's kind of like a square peg in a round hole. How do you protect that kind of constantly evolving verbal traditional knowledge? It's, it's an interesting area. If you go and um, Google United Nations and um, protection of uh, tr what they, the, the term that they use is traditional cultural expression, if you're interested in um, following up on that. It's a really interesting area of IP law and one that I think uh, probably hasn't had enough academic attention to it um, as it deserves. Mm, really interesting area. So, yeah, that would fall outside copyright because there's no material form. Um, obviously, there would be, uh, there would be um, originality but the other issue there with traditional cultural expression is authorship because if the cultural expression is passed down from generation to generation to generation and slowly changes and, and evolves with each retelling, who exactly is the author and who owns... This is another difficulty with traditional cultural expression. Is, is the whole notion of ownership. And that's what obviously one of the, the main stays of copyright law. You need to have an owner of the copyright, uh, the rights inherent in copyright, I should probably say. Uh, it's more about protecting the individual than, than a group. Isn't it? Exactly, it, it is. And um, this is why I say traditional cultural expression is probably really a very square peg that doesn't neatly fit into any of the round holes of, of IP protection currently. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And if you wanted to do uh, your end of semester paper on something like that, I'd be more than happy to uh, tweak a, um, a problem question with you if you wanted to. Oh, uh, look, I've got no, like, it's interesting. It sounds really interesting, but I was just trying to uh, get my head around these yeah, basic sort of elements, that's all. So yeah. I was, yeah. No. Like I think, oh, what are they talking about? And I'm looking through some notes that I've got, and then I'm, yeah, I threw that in as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's great. It shows me you've been thinking about this stuff, which is awesome. Um, so with that problem question you gave uh, with Roy and Nigel, I think it is. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of overlap there, isn't there? Like with design or copyright and. I saw a case somewhere, I can't remember, but it was talking about um, the meaning of words and how people use them. It has to be unique, but it doesn't have to be novel. So I, I don't know if that means original, like, you know, you, he's using Hungry Max, but <laughs> you're yeah. doing them. Yeah. yeah, I understand what you mean. Novelty is a, it's, it's a specifically patent-related issue. Yeah. Um, for copyright, you don't have to come up with the most, um, the kind of unique expression that no one has thought of before. But oh, okay. what you need to be able to show is that sufficient spark of originality, okay? So originality just shows, I like to think of it as flair. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's but he couldn't, those guys couldn't say like, Oh, we're well, using it because in the in the info, I mean, they're primarily doing it to bring business to them. So yeah. they couldn't say it's sort of as a defence. Uh, it was satirical, even though you use that word satirical in the info. I think there's a protection there. Aha. I'm glad to see your thinking because this will this will become relevant for week four, particularly. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's glad. I'm glad that you've picked up on that though. So I'll just put here idea, expression, dichotomy, and the whole idea of authorship. Okay, so we need to protect that, protect the common stock of uh, English language. 
and ideas. Okay, now, just before we launch into that problem, I wanted you to take away something from today's little dis pre discussion on the nuts and bolts of copyright. Can anybody tell me what the rule is on who owns commissioned works? There was a little mention of this in the chapter. So where we have Roy and Nigel and Mary. Think about that. Can anybody tell me what the rule on commissioned works is? No? I will is it, Sorry, is it, that, is it that the person who commissions the work has the copyright? Ah, I'm so glad you answered that. That is what would make sense to you and to me as contract lawyers, wouldn't it? Because we think, well, you know, if I've asked you to do something for me and you've done it and I've paid you, that I should own not just the physical item of what you've produced for me, but I should also own the IP rights that that uh, prop that physical item up, okay? We kind of tend to bundle the physical item and the IP right together in, in our heads conceptually. And we think, well, if I've given you money to take a photo for me or if I've given you money to draw a picture for me, then I get the picture but I also get the copyright. And that's where so, so many people go wrong. Because what you actually get if you don't say anything more in your contract uh, apart from you will do a drawing for me and I will pay you $20, that doesn't actually transfer or assign the copyright in that item. So once you pay you $20, you are entitled to that physical drawing but you do not own copyright in that drawing, okay? So the rule on commissioned works is really super important, particularly for the software industry. And in fact, I just had a couple of weeks ago, a, uh, a friend of mine come to me saying, oh, 20 years ago, <laughs> my auntie paid me to write some software for her, and I did, and she's been using it very effectively for 20 years, and now she wants to sell off that software. Now, classic, classic blunder, okay? That auntie did not ask for an assignment of the copyright in that software. So this is the really crucial point, if you ever get clients, anyone, your business to uh, commission the production of software, you need to not only get a license to use that software in your business, you need to specifically address the question of copyright ownership, okay? This is just an amazingly common misconception about how copyright works. And what I'll do is I will just flip over to, is everyone, can everyone see this on screen? Section 35 says the only change to that general rule about commissioned work, so you retain copyright in your work, uh, generally speaking, you just hand over the physical item. The only real exception to that is subsection five here. And that is where your agreement deals with the taking of a photograph for private or domestic purposes, or the painting or drawing of a portrait, or the making of an engraving. So you can see something of quite a personal nature. Okay, the first men mentioned person uh, is the owner of any copyright subsisting in the work by virtue of this part, 
But if at the time the agreement was made, that person, that is the person that's commissioning the item, made known to the author of the work, so the, uh, the artist or the photographer, the purpose for which the work was required, the author, that is the photographer or the artist, can stop the person from doing anything else with that item except for the purpose that was communicated. That's your only sliver of an exception there. Okay. What about, I'm just having, sorry, I've just got the, um, the act up on my screen here. What about section 98, dealing with commissioned films? Uh, films are a different thing. This is, I'm talking about part three original works here. So you're flipping over to part four subject matter other than works. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So that's quite a separate um separate issue so ownership of copyright in sound recordings um films and so forth is different to works but um there are issues in relation to um films you're absolutely right if the film is not a here we are where a person makes an agreement with another person for the making of a film and that film is made, the first person is the owner of copyright. So there you have the specific regime for films. Yes, you're absolutely right. But part four works, part four subject matter other than works are dealt with differently than works and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I know this is probably not particularly on point, but um, what we're just talking about reminds me of the story with the um, the Gateway Bridge, uh, the duplication of the Gateway Bridge. When the state government decided to make a second copy of it, they oh. they realised they didn't own the intellectual property to the design, and they needed to buy that for an exorbitant amount of money off the original oh. architects, so they could make a second one in the same way. Yes. And there you have copyright in all its glory, don't you? I mean, this is just an incredible oversight. I'm not sure how many government personnel were involved in the commissioning of that particular architectural drawing, but one would have thought that there was at least one person that put their hand up and said, yeah, I know we should probably work out who owns copyright in this. I know, I know that our, our, our contracts from that point onward uh, were very, very different. <laughs> yes, a bit of a uh, bitter lesson learnt there, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of heartening when such large um, government agencies make such blunders, isn't it, really? It makes the rest of us feel nicely human. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's uh, let us go on to this week's questions. And despite what it looks like here, this all this stuff is reasonably straightforward. Now that we've gone through uh, the preliminaries in terms of copyright nuts and bolts. So could Nigel Roy have saved money on the trademark application and just relied on copyright to protect their business name, Hungry Max? What do we think about that? Is it sufficiently original? Hungry Max? Do we have any notions of possibly case law that might help us out here? Hungry Max. Does the text mention um, cases that deal with short and relatively uninspiring slogans, titles? Yeah, names and titles can't be copyrighted, can they? There's a and then an Exxon case, I think I got here, they tried to copyright. Someone else used Exxon. Yes. I found that they could use Exxon if they wanted to. Uh, but I can't find it right now. Exactly. 
So uh, there's a case called Sullivan and F and H. I'll just write that down. Sullivan and F and H. And that held that there was no copyright in slogans like the resort that offers precious little. Uh, there was another one, Victoria against Pacific Technologies. And that one was help, help, driver in danger, call police, phone zero, zero, zero. Again, the problem here is that it really, particularly with that latter one, it just so the court said uh, was several words in the nature of saying something in ordinary parlance. Now, here, I don't think you'd even get to that level because it, it, Hungry Max is not even really communicating anything, really, is it? It's like the Exxon case. It's really the, the domain of trademarks, isn't it? It's not what we would say sufficiently original. There's not a whole lot of spark of creativity in calling a takeaway food place Hungry Max. I don't think there would be in any event. Right? Makes, makes me confused. <laughs> <laughs> Especially about the, later on when they're talking about the 11 secret herbs and spices. I mean, there's such a hodgepodge of different slogans there that I wouldn't feel like they're, you know, I was being led up the garden path and expect a, you know, cheeseburger or something from from Macca's if I was to buy their product. Absolutely. And these are the exact problems you would butt up against if uh, you were trying to register these things as a trademark. And this is why this problem is so useful, not just for copyright, but also trademark. There's a bit of patent law thrown in. There's potentially passing off um, and it's great that these little red flags are popping up in the back of your head here because even though copyright isn't necessarily designed to stop consumer confusion, trademark law certainly is, okay? So this, it's absolutely right that these red flags are going off in the back of your mind because they're exactly the, the kind of warning bells that you'll need to listen to when you're out in practice. So even where copyright doesn't fit, you know that trademarks is definitely going to be a problematic issue. Okay, so probably not hungry mats uh, wouldn't be protected there. What about, could they claim copyright existed in their manual? What's your stand here? Hosolito um, reminded us before. Labor? Yes. Um, so original, yeah, it, 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 it is the result of the author's skill, labor and effort, basically not just copied from or compiled without putting any effort in it. Exactly. Yes. There has to be sufficient labour, skill and judgment. Now, what about the whole issue of uh, what was the here? Labour and expense. Is that a sufficient standard to use for the court? Will the court just say, oh, okay, well, copyright's going to subsist. It might not have here, I'll put it at the end here, uh, spark of creativity. So what about if there's not, it's not really creative, but you've just invested a fair bit of money in creating whatever compilation this is. There's a couple of cases that I would like you to kind of touch on here. Anyone got any ideas? Hi AJ, is it the Ladbrook case? Ah, Ladbrook, yes, that was in relation to betting forms. And what did they say there? Sorry, I've just got the textbook. I think it was the test for originality was not an all or nothing, but one that raises a question of fact 
and degrees to the extent at which the apparent author has contributed skill, judgment or labour in producing the work. Yes, that's your skill, labour and judgment test. And ordinarily where you have that kind of thing happening, you will have that spark of creativity. But the, um, the desktop marketing systems case said, well, what about things like, um, you know, white pages, yellow pages? I mean, how exciting is that? <laughs> Does that does that spark does that have a spark of creativity there? And surprisingly, uh, the courts sub successful courts held that yes, there was sufficient uh, industrious collection of facts there. However, that was queried in the Ice TV case, and pretty much all of the judges on the High Court. Whilst they weren't specifically um, setting out to um, overturn the desktop decision, because everything they said really was just an obiter, pretty much all of the, the judgments queried this whole issue of industrious collection and that copyright would subsist if you just put enough money into it. Okay, and particularly French, Crennan and Careful. They there said that, generally speaking, if you do have a, a creation of a complex compilation um, or narrative, it will almost certainly require considerable skill and labour which involve both industrious, so they're kind of tipping their hat to desktop collection and creativity. So they're saying, okay, this has come down in that particular fashion. Desktop came down in that fashion, but really we don't want to ignore this whole issue of labour skill and judgement, some kind of spark of creativity, all right, here. Yeah. So usually, I mean, if I said to you, we're not looking at Nigel and Roy's manual here, we're going to look at, for example, Nigella Lawson's cookbook. Do you think that would be protectable by copyright? Do you think Nigella would claim copyright in her recipe books? <laughs> Multi-million dollar industry. So whilst the idea of a recipe for a burger might not be terribly inspiring, nevertheless, there will be probably, in this case, some kind of skill and judgment that have gone into the writing of the recipes and particularly the writing of the procedural aspects of business that are all compiled in the manual. So I would say probably protectable. All righty. Amanda, Amanda? Question? Oh, uh, yeah, I, uh, when I was reading my book here, I couldn't recall the name of the case, but it appears that if the creation, well, was made using computer programs, then there's basically no effort or some sort of skills used to create that thing. So it may not be subject to copyright. Is it correct? Or I couldn't remember the name of the case. Copyright has had a love-hate relationship with software and particularly in its early days, there was significant resistance to protecting software by copyright. What, what, yeah, sorry. What sorry. About if the creation or if the, if, the, if the knowledge or whatever is created using computer software or computer program? not basically created using labor or skill, but by computer program. 
Oh, I see. So you're saying if there's an automated program yes. that goes about compiling all of the, the facts that go into the compilation. Mm. Ah, perfect. Hustle time. Gold star. Because I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, in fact, in the, uh, where are we? Desktop. It was in desktop. Desktop marketing systems. Um, the, the subsequent case revolved around the issue of whether there was sufficient authorship. And because I, the only real um, work that had gone in was basically data entry and um, computer compilation of the results, uh, that was insufficient. Uh, so in, in the case, there was a simple alphabetical listing of telephone subscribers and um, the federal court said that there was no originality. Uh, copy, so the federal court, sorry, at first instance and on appeal, held the copyright subsisted uh, because of this industrious collection issue um, they said that it was okay, but later on the High Court criticised that. Now, this isn't actually, I thought that this was the case that mentioned it, but there was another case that mentioned where there was a compilation that had been created basically by um, bots, computer bots, that had gone and uh, harvested the data and it basically had been presented in a standard format. And the question there was, could we have copyright in something like that? The answer was no, because there was no human authorship. Okay? Now, I thought you were getting towards the idea of, can we protect software? And software is actually now well established, protected by copyright as a literary work. But I was starting to say previously that in the early days there was some argument about whether or not it should fit into that because uh, software programming just basically involves a series of zeros and ones and, you know, there was a, a query about whether or not there was going to be originality in that, but the legislation now makes it clear. Does that kind of answer your question, Rosalito? Yeah, sort of. It's just, um, you know, with the, with the advancement in, for example, artificial intelligence, you know, computer can do what human can do nowadays. So, so it's not just a simple, basically, computer program. It can... Uh, so sometimes, no, there could be probably no distinction between what human can author or what can a machine can uh, do. Yes, absolutely. And in that case, if it has been compiled by a computer or machine and there's no human author, then you're going to lack authorship, okay? So in that situation, then you won't have copyright subsisting in that work. Isn't there always an author, though? You've got to have someone that write the program. For a bot, don't you? Ah, but then there would be copyright in the software for the bot. Okay. We're talking about the downstream product of what the bot does. does. Oh, okay. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, any other queries before we move on? Sorry, AJ. I was just going to say on your um, your comment about how people were saying that software was just a collection of zeros and ones. And I thought that's a bit like saying that Shakespeare is just a collection of um, letters of the <laughs> alphabet. Well said, Kim. Well said. <laughs> Sorry, what was that comment? I was trying to come up with something like that too because my da dad's a programmer and so <laughs> I hate to hear that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and there was very, very heated battles about this in the early ancient days of which I actually recall. <laughs> um, but we now have legislative clarity on all of that, so the uh, programmers are eminently happy with their position. <laughs> um, can we say Fred in, infringed copyright in their manual? Can we just flip back to the problem here? 
this is this is a big problem with copyright works and infringement. What do you have to do? What constitutes infringement? You got to be doing something within the nature of copyright rights. So you're going to be publishing the work to you know you've got to be uh, communicating the work to the public. You've got to be uh, you've got to be you know. Let's have a flip over to, here we are, nature, 31, here. You're either going to be reproducing the work in a material form, publishing, performing the work in public, communicating the work to the public, making an adaptation or something like that. So you're doing that without actually owning the copyright in the work that you are using, okay? Here... Nigel and Roy employed Fred. He had access to the recipe. All right. He set up business across the street and he applied all of the knowledge. So he read the manual. Now it's in his noggin. And set up business in competition, put the manual into practice. Has Fred done any of these things? What do you think? Can we nab Fred? The problem is that the facts don't tell you he did any of that stuff, do they? He didn't necessarily make a copy of it. He didn't set about to publish it, communicate it to the public. He didn't make an adaptation. And, you know, so what have we got on, on Fred, unfortunately? Not a whole lot. In order to prove infringement, you've got to be doing one of those, you've got to be uh, um, using the copyright work in the fashion intended for the copyright owner and you need to have either done it in, in reproducing the whole or a substantial part of the work and... So Fitzgerald and Eliades tell us towards the end of the chapter, you've got to be in relation to the whole or substantial part of the work and there has to be an objective similarity or causal connection to use of the work. So we're not told that Fred actually does any of that, are we? He just has access to it, so he reads it and he applies it. So I'm thinking here, probably no infringement unless he copied the manual or otherwise utilised any of the copyright rights in section 31. Yes? Problems there. Okay. Mary, what about the logo? Do you think copyright subsists in the logo? It's a drawing. Yes? Probably. An artistic work? Yes? Seems to be Mary's original work of authorship. Okay. Who owns it? What's the rule on commissioning? Was it commissioned? I would say Mary owns it. Yes. Mary does own it. We don't even know if it was commissioned, do we? We're just told 
She designed this stuff for them. Yeah, without consideration. We're not told of any consideration, are we? She's just kind of gotten excited by the whole fact that her friends are opening a burger joint. Maybe she really likes burgers. <laughs> and she just wanted to jump on board. I mean, this is often what happens with a startup. People get all excited and they just totally forget, you know, what is our legal relationship that underlies all of this stuff? And this is where, you know, when the social relationship breaks down and the legal relationship's been ignored, people go flocking to their lawyers, okay? So it doesn't even seem as though there was any commissioning going on. She certainly hasn't agreed to assign her copyright in the uh, drawing to them, so it'll likely be Mary. Uh, do I mean we know that for infringement there's going to be reproduction of the work? So was there reproduction of the work by Nigel and Roy? What have they done with the work? What have they done with Mary's drawing? They've put it on all their menus along with the slogan, right? So it certainly seems to me like there's been a reproduction on menus inside the restaurant. Perhaps we're not told, but uh, possibly on, uh, you know, items inside and or things like napkins, etc. We certainly know, for sure, we know that it was used on the menu. Okay. So, AJ, what happens if Mary drew the logo and commissioned a, a printing company to print the menus? What if she supplied all of that to them? If she supplied all of that? Sweet. That's, that's you know, Nigel and Roy can say, mm. well, we haven't done a thing, have we? We haven't done anything that would infringe your Section 31 rights. You're the one that has the right to copy. You're the one that has the right to communicate to the public. We haven't done that. Oh, potentially they could have communicated to the public if it was on, you know, the light-up menu behind where you place your orders or something like that. But, I mean, if she'd gone ahead and gone to a neon sign company and helped them out because she just loved burgers, um, yeah, she couldn't complain later on that they were doing what she had set them up to do. Yes? Substantial part, well, yes, they took, they took the logo plus slogan. So, it seems that the logo might pose a problem. What about the slogan? We touched on this before in terms of originality. What's the slogan that we're looking at? Here. What was the upshot of the Victoria and Pacific Technologies case where uh, the issue was help, help, driver in danger? You can't protect something consisting simply of several words saying something in ordinary parlance. Also in the Sullivan and F and H case, the resort that offers precious little. I think you're going to have problems here. And I think particularly the F&H case um, problem, the F&H case where the resort that offers precious little was insufficiently original to warrant. Right, protection. Yep. Well, if anyone was going to own it, it'd be Mary. 
wouldn't it? Because we just established up above that she hasn't assigned, hasn't assigned. Was there a reproduction? Yes, it was used on the menus. Was it a substantial part? Yes, they used all of the slogan. On balance, I think the F and H case would probably stop uh, any subsistence of copyright here. Okay. So that is the issue with copyright. It works well when what you are trying to protect is very clearly protectable. So a musical work, a dramatic work. But where you've got literary works like this and they are really saying something very generic about a, an item or a place, you know, the resort that offers precious little, you're going to have threshold questions of originality crop up, okay? And that's the thing I really wanted you to take away uh, from this angle of the problem. Apart from the other really big ticket item, which is that commissioned works don't transfer or assign the IP rights that run underneath the item that's been commissioned. Okay. Do I have any queries on, I'll stop sharing now so I can see all of your lovely faces. Do I have any queries on that stuff? <laughs> That's a technical phrase, isn't it? That stuff. <laughs> Do I have any queries on originality, commissioned works, the nature of copyright works, the nature of infringement? No? All relatively... Happy on that stuff? Yes? Cool bananas. Oh, we have a yeah, so so. <laughs> Usually, as I said, the issue of originality will mainly crop up with things like literary works. Where you have something that is of itself usually a quite a creative endeavour, particularly things like musical works. Films, and that's a part, part four um, matter, but um, like I said, dramatic works. I mean, those kinds of things almost of themselves are going to be sufficiently original. It's really, it's mostly in the area of literary works where you will get this kind of originality problem cropping up. The only artistic um case that I know of where originality um, did crop up was the case, and I'll put it here in the, um, in the chat box, it was a case called Kenrick and Lawrence. And in that, um, in that case, that's for those who didn't see the chat box, I'm not sure whether it's reproduced on the recording, it's K-E-N-R-I-C-K, -K, Kenrick and Lawrence, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E. And that was a case where you had a drawing. It was a, um, a drawing that was done for a voting um, ballot paper. And uh, they wanted to be able to show illiterate um, voters how to vote. And so there was a drawing of a box with a hand, with a pencil and a tick, okay, now, there, there was a question as to whether that would be protectable by copyright. And the court held there, no, there was actually a threshold level of originality required here. You do need to protect that common stock of ideas. And how else were you going to actually show illiterate voters how to put a mark in the box? You had to show a box. You had to show a hand with a pencil and you had to show the mark. Can you see? So there was really no other way that you could draw that set of requirements all coming together in the one depiction. 
do you, do you see? So that's that's about the only case I know of where originality is kind of cropped up with artistic works. Um, usually it will be inherent, but uh, yeah, question. What happened to the guy from Men at Work? Is that the guy who killed himself? You put some things there at the Kookaburra, sits in the and then uh, what did something happen there? And he got must have been other things going on. Why would you? Oh, it, it was a terrible, terrible development um, subsequent to the case. He fell into a deep depression. For those that don't um, don't know what we're talking about, um, Jacob has just raised the issue of dear Greg Ham, who was the uh, flute player, flautist for Men at Work. And he was the one that came up with that very famous flute riff that... Uh, unfortunately, uh, w was a um, a comment in a game show um, on on the ABC, I think it was. Um, Spicks and Specs was the program, and they said, "What children's um, what what children's nursery rhyme sounds like this flute riff?" And then all of a sudden the uh, copyright owners of the children's nursery rhyme, the, the old kookaburra sits in the old gum tree song, um, pricked up their ears and went and compared Greg Ham's flute riff to their nursery rhyme and then filed proceedings for copyright infringement there. Um, there was evidence that uh, the flute riff was just a contemporaneous on the fly invention by Greg Ham. There was also, I believe, some some evidence led that they were all kind of high on marijuana when this all happened. Um, but uh, unfortunately for Men at Work, it was held that there was a substantial part of the nursery rhyme reproduced by the riff, even though it was in a different key, different timing, um, obviously very different context. Uh, nevertheless, substantial reproduction and, uh, yes, the court found infringement and poor old Mr Ham fell into a deep depression after the verdict came down and, and you know, said... Um, to, to the rest of the band members, you know, this is all I'm going to be remembered for is, is copyright infringement. Where Where is my artistic and creative merit going to fit? No one's going to remember me for, for any of that. I'm going to have this hanging around my neck and um, it, it was just terrible. Um, I've always hated Spicks and Specs. I've never watched <laughs> Well, oh, Spicks and Specs is on, I go, keep going. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just saying that because of this. I, I, didn't, I no, didn't know the connection, but now I feel justified in, yeah. No, that's, I reckon plagiarism, not academically, but I think there was an article in Vanity Fair by Hitchens, and I never, Christopher Hitchens, I never, I think I read a couple of paragraphs, but he was making the case that plagiarism in, in artistic uh, universe is sort of necessary because it's that free f flow of ideas and you take something I suppose there's not I mean there's only I think six or seven different plot lines and there's all variations and stuff and nothing's and I suppose if someone takes a little melody and uses it in their song you know why would you go after them like that but yeah. hey well they did and they certainly they did, got yeah. <laughs> Um, certainly nowhere near as as uh, higher damages that they were asking for, but nevertheless, multi millions of dollars and uh, more so the reputational damage it did, which was catastrophic really for poor old Mr. Ham. But that is, and I'm so glad you raised that because just in parting, and I'm I'm aware that we've gone over, so um, sorry about that to everybody, but. Uh, have a little think about that. I've actually put up one of the um, one of the videos that my kids done for Musically. I mean, look at Musically. It's it's just it's an amazing app. But you know, kids can take the the audio from a YouTube clip of a song. They can put that onto iMovie. They can put their own visuals in. 
They can speed up the song, slow down the song. They can mash it with other songs. We tend to think that this kind of use is all perfectly acceptable in our day and age. Um, perhaps not so much when poor old Mr Greg Ham was fighting the good fight in court, but certainly now, you know, we have so much downstream use of copyright works. The whole issue of what should be fair use is really hotly debated. And that's why I've, I've put it down as one of the presentation topics. So I'm glad you raised that and, that and I'm glad you're thinking critically about all of this stuff because that's exactly the kind of critical thought that needs to be going on for your presentations down the track. Anyway, if I don't have any more queries, I'll wrap it up. Thank you, guys. That was fun. And don't forget, check out the competition challenge for this week. Go in. There is a prize. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't decided what that will be. I'm kind of thinking maybe, you know. Um, where, anyone got any suggestions? Just off topic, where do you post the responses to the questions, which I still haven't done? It, do you just do it in the, is there a group discussion thing for each week where you put it? Because your, your site's got so much packed in, I get lost. And that's, oh, sorry. I'm not being, oh, no, that's, <laughs> I know. I just usually it's tutorial problems or something um, um normally the tutorial problems we'll just discuss in but, but for that component of the the uh, participation mark that you've got oh, there, sure. um, yes don't you have to make a document at the end because i remember for constitutional law and a, a cup of um, an administrative law they wanted us to put together you'd post it every week and then you'd put it together in a Word document and throw it in. And, and you've got a, a, a thing like that too. And I checked it again and I don't know what it is. It must be my one. And I know I said it was okay, but I looked on the different things the diff for the different assessments and it's still got 2015 for oh, my one. Else yeah, I don't, know how to take, I don't know how to take screenshots. Maybe I'll, I'll work out how to take screenshots and I'll send them to you. So maybe you can put your finger on what exactly is wrong. Sure. No, if, you, right. if you want to post to the forum, there is a separate forum um, set up for each week on Moodle. Um, I'm more than happy for you to post to those. However, I'm equally happy for you to tweet me. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, I don't want to use that tweet account, that Twitter account too much because I like to struggle of, with it. Yeah, a lot okay. of people have problems with Twitter, so that's fine. Um, there is a separate forum specifically set up for each week's discussions. So okay. go in, post your pithy questions and, and comments to those. Or if everyone um, likes the whole, I don't know if anyone's looked at perusal. Have you looked at... Yeah, I was going to do that today, but I didn't get around. Can you just click on that where it says George 7025 or something, the code that you're supposed to put you in? Just, no, you just need to visit perusal.com. Okay. Yep. And then you just put in that code and it will enrol you as a student in that course. Perusal is awesome. Go and check it out. Um, I've got a PDF of the first week's stuff there and a PDF of my week one materials. I'm going to, I will go in tonight and I'll put a PDF of the week two materials, the week three materials. And what you can do with perusal is that you can um, highlight any word in any of the documents that are up there and post a comment. And that would be a really great way for us to get some discussions happening on the various different weeks uh, materials so you it's okay can, to just write well, what does this mean all the time yeah, well, absolutely because like, that's, fine. Yeah, the, that's mainly what i do what does this mean what does this word mean sure <laughs> no problem no problem that's what i'm here for okay <laughs> okay so go, jump in and have a look at perusal because i'm using it with the honors students as well and i'm really keen to get an idea as to what students think of it so i'll go in i'll load up the week two materials and you can jump in and make your comments as you see fit. Sweet. Okay, go forth and conquer. 
I think we have um, confidential information and patent law next week. So good luck with that one. <laughs> and if there's no more queries, I will say adieu. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, Anselita. Bye, Vanessa. Thanks, AJ. No worries. Bye. Bye-bye.